Okay, good afternoon. Um, this is a screen recording on the extended project qualification and specifically about the role of the supervisor. So I'll go through what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to be looking at why a student might want to do the EPQ very briefly. I'm going to look at two different outcomes, which is the artifact versus the written report. I'm going to look at the role of the supervisor. That will be my main thrust. And in doing so, I'll touch on the assessment criteria, the idea of project management, uh, choosing a title, uh, Project Q, which is the software management system that you're going to learn, and um, how to record student learning. Okay, so let's get started then, all right? Just very briefly, why would a student want to do the EPQ? Well, in particular, evidence is independent study. It's very highly valued by a number of universities. An A-star grade will earn you 28 UCAS points. And um, it is a wonderful way of evidencing passion and curiosity. Many students in desk in my school use the um, EPQ for their personal statement, for quite a major part of their personal statement. It's also extremely valuable if you're going to be an Oxbridge student or a medical student, it gives you stuff to talk about in your interview. But above all things, it's about the practical application of knowledge and students get to choose their own topic. Okay, so I'll go through some of that now. So I spoke about the actual outcome of the EPQ and it can be divided into two main things. On the right side here, you have an artifact. It's something that a student can make. It doesn't have to be a machine <coughs> or something technical. It can be a piece of art, it could be a dance, it can be a speech, it could be a podcast, it could be numerous things. On the other side, the more traditional uh, way of doing the EPQ is a 5,000 word research paper. And that the vast majority of students in desk do a research paper. Probably about 20% are doing artifacts now. But a number of uh, students are choosing this more flexible option. If you do a research paper, as I said, it's a thousand words. If you do an artifact, you have to write a report of over a thousand words. I'll talk a little bit more about artifacts now because I think they're a little bit more complex and more unfamiliar. So all artifacts have to have a purpose, a research purpose or an aim. And the key idea is that they must be evaluated at the end. They must be seen whether they are fit for purpose. So students, when they begin the artifact process, need to think very closely about how they will evaluate it and decide whether the artifact was successful or not. Um, both the written report and the artifact has to have a research element to it. So some students start the EPQ and they think that they can do an artifact and they could just do a painting or something like that. Of course, they have to do the same amount of research that a research uh, student would do. So they might have to do aspects of a literature review, read complicated articles, etc., about a topic. However, they've also given the choice of going on notice boards, reading blogs, uh, meeting people, interviewing people, engaging in trial and error research, having a hypothesis. If it's a science one, they can go into the lab and do something. So it really does, is a very flexible idea of what research is. Right, moving on. Here's an example, a beautiful example of a artifact that was done by a desk student. Here you can see he bought a Ducati S2 motorcycle that he shipped in from <coughs> Italy. It hadn't been driven for 10 years. Many of the components were lost and he had to find out exactly how to refit it. And in the end, uh, his his way of evaluating the artifact was to drive it and to sell it. And in fact, this particular student made a great deal of money out of his EPQ, which is always good. Okay, so just very briefly, if you do an artifact, you will do, this is how you'll get assessed. You'll do an artifact, you'll do a report that accompanies it and explains the process of construction and research. You'll do a public presentation that is ended with questions and answers, and you'll have a production log which discusses and gives the backstory of the whole project, and I'll be going into that in more detail in a minute. If you do a report, there are only three components to it. There's the written report itself, the 5,000 words, the public presentation, and the long production log, which I'll be concentrating on quite a bit. 
Now, the role of the supervisor is really important. Um, I think I'm going to begin talking about the role of the supervisor by saying what it's not. And this is a slide that I do with students. Supervisors don't chase students for work. This is a voluntary uh, qualification. Supervisors don't do the research for the student. Supervisors don't find resources for the student. Supervisors don't teach content. Uh, they don't actually sit down and help you plan the structure of the EPQ. And they don't edit and correct the project. They offer very generalized feedback, as I'll explain now. So you might actually think to yourself, well, what is the role of the supervisor? It doesn't seem to be that of teacher, and it's not. It's far more like being a coach. If you're a supervisor, you will have regular meetings with your students, perhaps every two to three weeks, I would say is about the right amount of time. I would say that some of these meetings might only be five minutes if the student doesn't have any questions and they're doing well. Um, but other meetings might be more extended. They might be 20 minutes or half an hour, depending on the needs. The main role of the supervisor is to act as a kind of mentor or coach, or another term that I like to use is a critical friend, to make the student think, to set them problems and to ask them if they've thought about different things. The supervisor will help the student arrive at a title. They will advise the student on project management, timing, deadlines, smart targets. They might give them research tips. They might give them advice on resources. They have to work on the production log on Project Q, and I will be going through what that entails in a moment. And then at the end of the project, the supervisor has two very important roles. One is to assess the presentation and to keep notes on this presentation. Another is to mark and annotate the final project. And that's done under my supervision. That's something that I really give a lot of training in because it's quite a complicated thing. So you might think to yourself, well, um, what if I don't know about this subject? Once again, that's not your role. The student can engage what we call technical mentors or consulting specialists. So if they need to know about nanoparticles and you don't know, that's not your job. You could suggest some people for them to look at, but they've got to go out and do that research themselves. Okay, So it is not a teaching role. At the end of the project, you see that it will be marked out of 50. And I'll be going through these assessment criteria now because they're different from anything in the A-level or IB syllabus, even if you've done the extended essay as I did for many years in the IB. So the uh, assessment objectives, many of them, will be your judgment of the student informed by the evidence that they give you. So 20% of the grades will come from management, okay, which is timing, skills, achieving objectives, etc. Project management ideas. 20% of the marks will come from the use of resources, having a big research base, treating that research base very analytically and evaluating it, deciding what is fact, what's opinion, what's bias. Uh, the limitations of it, etc. Um, science students in particular find this much harder than, say, politics and history students because they're not used to challenging scientific reports, etc. So that's a skill that I try to teach them in the EPQ lessons. The majority of the marks, 40% of the marks, uh, come from develop and realize, and this involves problem solving and decision making. So this is why the production log, which I'll go through in a moment, is so important. They have to keep the story of their project for you. And 20% of the marks are for um, self-evaluation, reflection, learning you know, from the, uh, the project and knowing what they would do next time. OK, so I've called this the, the story of the research. Okay. And if we go back to those, you notice a lot of the assessment criteria are the, the story of the research. So students have to keep very careful records of everything they do, because the assessment criteria is holistic. It looks at planning, it looks at timelines, it looks at mind maps. So many students will have a large number of appendices. Some students will have 30 pages of appendices, especially if they're doing an artifact. Um, if they're doing a film, for instance, you know, they'll have shot lists, they'll have all kinds of planning and editing and, you know, all of that kind of story should be included in the project. 
So I'm a literature, philosophy, politics, history style teacher. And usually when you look at coursework, you just look at the coursework piece. In this case, you're going to look at the whole backstory. So again, that's why it's much more holistic. In terms of supervision, I very much recommend that either the student or the supervisor records meetings because evidencing learning from these meetings is very important. I usually get my student to just take out their phone and to use voice recorder. You can also use transcription software that I teach them how to use and I'll save that for another time. There's a strong emphasis in the EPQ on what they call dialogic learning. So they're looking to see that the student is engaging in meaningful conversations with you and they are learning from that and um, they are having really interesting critical dialogues with you and they use these um, to update their journal. Okay. Now in terms of expert help, they can use other teachers in the school and for instance I am the supervisor of 18 students at the moment but I also regularly see maybe 15 or 20 as a technical um, you know, advisor. So if people want to find out about, say, classics, or if they want to find out about philosophy, they can use me. So don't feel shy about saying, why don't you see one of my colleagues who's a biologist or who's a physicist, or etc., because I do that all of the time. When students do use a technical advisor, they need to record this in their production log because obviously plagiarism and collusion and academic honesty is an important part of the course. And the students will have to sign a candidate declaration that will be countersigned by you. So it's fine to get help, but that help needs to have limitations. Okay. So the, the production log is the bit of paperwork that the students keep that tells all of the story of how they do the project, okay? It's a vital part of the EPQ. It shouldn't be seen as separate like a piece of paperwork. It charts the student's progress from the beginning of their ideas to the last critical reflections that they have. And I'll be showing you that in a moment, okay? We use a piece of software because we have 158 students currently doing EPQs in the college. And it would be unmanageable for me to monitor these students without my darling Project Q, which is a software uh, program that you'll get used to as well. And this stores all of the details as the students enter their different data. You as the supervisor will also check this and you will lock certain entries as the students finish them. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment, yeah? And this will give you a complete record of the EPQ from start to finish. When they've finished it, they will download it into PDF form. They'll print it off and it goes on the top of the project just to show how important it is. So if I quickly pause now and I ask you to go to Project Q and then we'll actually get you working on it and seeing how that goes. Um, so another thing about Project Q, I'll send you this presentation if you want, because there are two videos that are worth you watching. The first is from Project Q. It just tells you how to get around Project Q, and it's made by them. And then I've made a little short seven-minute video on how to do the first entry, which is called the Initial Ideas, which we aim to do in kind of December time, okay? Now, um, just so that you know, um, all the students belong to a particular course, and as I said, you should automatically see them as soon as you 365. However, for you, mate, you're going to have to go between the two. You know that, don't you? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so your three should be finishing in sort of December time, round about there, let's hope. Okay, so just to give you an idea, this is the idealized timeline that I have. It doesn't always work, okay? So they begin in September. They do their initial ideas in December, and I'll explain to you why in a moment. They do a candidate proposal where they actually say what they're going to do in January. Now, you may look at that and think, they're doing nothing for four months. I'm teaching them intensive lessons at that time. I'm teaching them how to research, how to use databases, how to use Google Scholar, how to reference, how to do quantitative data, qualitative data, all kinds of things. And the idea is, in the meantime, their homework is to be researching all the time. 
So we don't want them just to choose the title out of thin air immediately. We want three or four months of genuine research before they try to get a good title. Uh, in February, they'll do a planning review, which is when they break the, t the project down and they work out how they're going to do it. They do a mid-project review in June. That's when they decide their final title. The idea is that they draft over the summer. That doesn't always work. And they should um, hand in an, a, a first draft in September. They do a project planning review, which is how they're going to change that draft. They, re uh, they should then complete the written report. Then they have a public presentation where they take uh, questions and things like that. They complete their project queue and they print it all up and hand it in. And in the end, it could be up to say 12 or 14 or 15,000 words. It's quite a substantial piece of research, okay? I'm not going to go through all of this because I think that timeline explained it. But if you see on the production log here on Project Q, you or I will tick these off as we go along. And the end of the project will have them all ticked off, in particular this record of marks. The students will then download the production log. And as I say, that will go onto the front of their project. Okay. Just to get people um, thinking about um, the actual questions now, because that's one of your main roles, I just want to say, I'm going to sum this up quite quickly. Good research questions are very focused. They go beyond the curriculum. They are arguable. And this is a very important one, especially for science ones. A lot of science students just throw loads of information. The research question must have argument and counter-argument. It must be phrased as a question. There has to be su sufficient source material for them. And we tend to avoid questions that say how far and to what extent, because the exam board don't like those. I always use Bloom's taxonomy in the EPQ. So I looked and I told the students about this. And I said, listen, if you give me loads of facts, even if you understand them, you're, that's a low skill. We want you operating up here, analyzing, evaluating, and being creative. So that's something that you can discuss with them when they do their questions. So time for me to give you a little task. I'm going to pause the video. Go through these. I think we'd all agree, number one, no. It's obviously, it's not a question. It's not arguable. It's going to throw loads of information at you. It will be at best a grade D. Apple's influence on technology. Again, it's not really arguable. It's going to give you lots of information. If you set a question like, uh, is it true to say the iPhone was a revolution, you know, in design? That could be arguable, couldn't it? Yeah. Um, this is uh, Amina Malik's old one. Are graphemes a revolutionary material? They got her into, got her into Oxford. <laughs> um, I was her supervisor. It was very difficult for me to understand it. Uh, British propaganda in the First World War. We can see that's a bad title, but we could fix it, couldn't we? And we could, you know, focus on an element of it. Is stem cell research a good thing? What do you think? I probably don't like the wording. And also a good thing is to sort of colloquial, isn't it? You'd want it to you know, be a bit more specific than that. Is psychopathy ultimately a genetic phenomenon? Yeah, that worked. Okay, that works. Psychopaths, are they genetic, basically? Arguments for nuclear disarmament? Nah, but we could rephrase it, couldn't we, to make sure? What about this one? The Chernobyl tragedy, human error, or fatal design flaw? Yeah, it's good. I thought you were being skeptical. No, it worked quite well. That's actually been done, and that's a good one. The Great Divide, to what extent can income inequality be overcome in Brazil? Is it to what extent? To what extent, because the head of the EPQ, and she may watch this, so I'll be careful what I say, is a further mathematician. She's also the head of further maths. So she wants things in numbers where you have a, when you say to what extent. So we avoid that. There are two things we don't like about this one, to what extent, and also it calls for speculation. And speculation is never a good thing. So if anyone says, you know, like, Will we have a city on Mars in 2050? Well, God knows. You know, we have no ability to predict the future. So we avoid those highly speculative kind of ones. How does architecture influence fashion? It's too broad. We'd probably have to, if we were going to do this, focus it in on one place. And we'd have to look at that correlation and say, can we actually make a judgment 
would we be able to produce empirical evidence of how architecture influences fashion? So I think we'd have to be very careful with that. This one, of course, is very good. The Grenfell one, it's very specific. There's an answer to it. Was Britain right to Brexit? I'd say no. But uh, <laughs> what do you think as a uh, EPQ title? How do you find what right? Yeah, it's difficult. Really cool. really cool. Well, we're in the midst of the chaos as well, so we have no idea. There, there would be an argument by certain people that we're going to benefit in 10 years' time, etc. So we can't tell. It's a bad title. And I've got someone who wanted to do that, and instead of saying, you know, what were the causes of Brexit? Look at something like that. You know, was it immigration fear or was it, you know, a sense that, you know, that Europe was too bureaucratic or you could do something like that, couldn't you? Okay, so what does the student need to do under your guidance? At the, the idea is that they uh, find an area which is specific. They always begin broad and they go specific. So maybe they begin with like, I'm really interested in serial killers. They all love serial killers. And then they start to read and stuff like that. And in the end, they'll say, well, actually, I'm really obsessed by Ted Bundy. This is really interesting. And then they might decide that there's an arg. As they're reading, they will find the argument. So that's why we have this long three, four month period here. Yeah? It's up to us, the coordinator and the supervisor, to make sure that there's no duplication from the curricula. So that's what we were talking about earlier, mate. And the initial idea is that it's one of the things you want to write about, yeah? They're going to begin um, the project immediately and to see if it's feasible or not. A lot of them try and do something that's like a PhD level. It's got to be answerable, it's got to be feasible. They should be taking lots of careful notes and showing you this, showing you their research, showing that they're keeping evidence of citations and references. They need to read widely, but also carefully and critically. So again, you can ask them, are you challenging this? Have you looked for bias? Do you think that this is objective, etc.? And so the students at the moment now are thinking about the initial plan, okay? So they're not really at hard titles like these yet. Something like that usually takes a few months. They are at general titles perhaps at the moment now. And that's the first thing that the supervisor does. It helps the student move towards something more specific, okay? And this is the record of ideas in Project Q, it's the first thing. You can see that the student doesn't have to have an exact title. Here's one um, that a student used, Beauty, uh, Criminal but Beautiful Study of Graffiti and Social Control. You may think that that's not a question, but you can see that it has an argument and a counter argument, so I would allow that one through, especially at this particular time. The next stage after the initial ideas is the candidate proposal, and that's a formal research question. So this is the moment when you will decide whether you're going to approve that or not. Now, here's the thing. It is a working title, so it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just make the decision, is this helpful for the student in their research? They have two or three other chances to tweak it, uh, they don't have to have it exactly right at this stage. Just so that you know, they do one EPQ class a week with me or another teacher, Mitch Burke, Tom Powell, and Phil Oakley. We are the EPQ teachers, and they study all kinds of skills. As soon as you're formally um, supervisors, I'll send you a list of all the skills I'm covering in class, and then you'll know how that might help them. Every single one of my lessons is on the SharePoint, okay, and you can use this QR code. You have total access to all of them. There's lots of examples of student projects there. I put in um, projects from my former school and the school together with videos, um, uh, and also I have a YouTube channel as well. I'm not just trying to boost my numbers, but on this. <laughs> oh, I've got, got 10,000 views on one of my videos Ooh. now. Thinking about leaving teaching. Um, <laughs> and I've got about 20 different videos there of different skills for the EPQ. So that's one of the things, I'm not suggesting you watch these videos, but it's something that you can direct the students towards, okay? 
So, I know we're all busy, so I'm going to conclude, okay? So we've looked at the advantage of the EPQ, how it teaches research skills. I can honestly say, and this is not just because I'm the coordinator, that it goes far beyond the skills required by coursework, I feel. And it's one of the reasons why universities like it so much. When um, the IB was seen as a superior qualification to A-levels is when the EPQ came out. And it's because universities identified the extended essay as something they really liked. If students do the EPQ, I think it's better than the extended essay. We've looked at the artifact in the, uh, versus the written report, and that's a nice thing about the EPQ. You can have a flexibility of outcome. So science and math students, for instance, can build wonderful artifacts. I've got further, three further math students now doing textbooks or websites where they show how to do very complex mathematical equations and stuff. So they, for science, artifacts often work better, I think, than research questions. We've looked at how your role is not as a teacher, it's more like a coach or a Socratic role where you question. Uh, we've looked at the assessment criteria. We've looked at this need to record and to be able to uh, save this backstory. We've looked at how to choose the title, how you move from the general to the specific. We've looked a little bit at Project Q, and I've introduced you to some of the resources to help supervisors. So I do hope that that was a useful session today, and obviously I'll be offering further training in the future.